took a picture of John Kennedy over on the South Lawn, and he had his photographer, and I said, why'd you bring that? He said, oh, Sidey, he said, I'm sure you won't have film in your camera or something like that. So it's good. To, well, uh, Mr. President, what I wanted to do was, uh, as you well know, just briefly uh, uh, get your thoughts on D-Day, your memories of it, uh, you know, like the films and that. Let's start out chronologically because my hunch is that as a boy, World War I was very much in your, uh, it was even in mine, my father was over there, and France, the idea of Americans fighting in France must have been something that you dealt with uh, as a kid. Well, I was, a, uh, as a matter of fact, in first grade at the time, but the, uh, the, the fever, the fervor, and the, uh, of course, if you remember it, in that war, the great propaganda about atrocities in Belgium and so yeah. forth, which were uh, really strange and foreign yeah. to us, and so they made a tremendous impact yeah. uh, on everyone. But uh, yeah. yes, I grew up, uh, and I can remember as a small child, uh, aware of all of this, uh, having nightmares th that uh, uh, they would be marching down the street. You oh, know, yeah. I had no conception mm -hmm. of yeah. how they would get there or anything, but, uh, and waking up thinking, where would I hide if, <laughs> if this were true? And American GIs, I assume, uh, in that story were uh, quite the heroes in your yes. boyhood. Yes. As a matter of fact, I remember uh, a troop train coming through. We lived in Galesburg at the time. And a troop train coming through, and my mother took my brother and me down there to, as everyone went down to, when the train stopped, and to, you know, show their support for the soldiers, and all the windows in the cars were open, and the soldiers all waving out. And I remember my mother lifted me up, and I had a penny, and I handed it to a soldier for good luck. I'll be dying. And I've often wondered who he was and uh, if he had good luck. Yeah. Uh, that's wonderful. What then, where were you at D-Day, June 6, 1944? Well, D-Day, then I was at my desk in the uh, first motion picture unit of the Army Air Force, Culver City. Uh, we were directly, that post was directly under uh, Air Corps intelligence. And we were responsible for all of the uh, Air Corps teams, photography teams. We trained them, put them together, and sent them all over the world to every uh, air group. Did you know it was coming? Did you know the day? Yes, except that did not know that exact moment, because if you remember, the, uh, there was a 36-hour break in the weather on the channel. Yes. And when Eisenhower got word of that, he gambled and said go, because other than that, they didn't know how long they might have to wait. And, of course, the longer you waited, the more the enemy could be prepared and know of your preparations. So we were generally aware, just as we'd known that um, there had been an original plan much earlier, uh, maybe a year earlier, and um, was evidently decided uh, against that. There was, um, there was not agreement among the Allies as we understood it. But we were, uh, in addition to all those combat camera crews, then we handled all the film and the, uh, the documentaries and training film and everything else. I and I was, I was the uh, executive officer of the, of the oh, base. How did the word come to you first? Do you remember that moment? That I'm trying to remember. Um, did you listen to the radio then? Uh, what, what did you no, do? No, I'm quite sure there? that we got it officially and probably before it was public. I see, I see. And, uh, but I actually cannot uh, bring to mind that, um, that exact detail. Yes. But it was no surprise to us yeah. because, as I say, we, we knew and, uh, that it was in the offing and we had the crews there and yes. everything. Did, you, did it dominate your, uh, your life then for the next uh, few hours after oh, the word came? Oh, yes, came? yes. This, um, and as the uh, reports would come in, and as I say, when the film began to arrive then after D-Day, yeah. because we had access to uh, all the film from not only the Air Force branch, but other branches, mm -hmm. and we put together uh, staff reports for the general staff. I see. Uh, like putting a newsreel together. I see. And, uh, Tell me about that. Well, 
you'd watch that film, go into the projection room and watch that film that was going to be edited. And you'd see so many shots that people have seen since on television of the troops coming off the landing barges and heading for the beach and up the beach. And I would watch as closely as I could because knowing that this was real and they were under fire and it just used to tear you in two because you out there and all those men, you'd see the individuals that were hit go down. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I had one interesting story later after the war out of that. A young man from my hometown was a naval officer and he was on a ship that was picking up the wounded when they would be ferrying the wounded back out in the landing barges to the, uh, these boats offshore. And he was on the bridge and down below on the deck they were pulling them aboard. And he, through the glasses, was watching a German pillbox, an artillery pillbox, on the beach or up on the, the bluffs. And he saw them, he could, he could even see the range find, the man with the range finder, uh, you know, yeah. setting, getting the range. And the shot came over and landed uh, just short of their ship. And then he watched and the second shot came and was a little long. Well, that's artillery <laughs> practice. You then split yeah. the difference. Yeah. And he knew that the third shot, and he could see the man up there in the range, he knew the third shot was going to be it. And he said he just had an irresistible desire to put the glasses down and tell the men down on deck, never mind. Mm -hmm. And while he was watching and feeling that and thinking that, the pillbox disappeared. Our cruisers behind them offshore, shelling, got a direct hit and the third shot never came. Did you have any relatives or any other special friends involved? Well, friends, but uh, yeah. no, no relatives. He, have you been back there at all? Have you gone to North, seen the beach uh, since uh, the war? No, and uh, Nancy has. I, well, I, uh, some years ago when I was there and went across to France, landed at Calais, uh, not too far from all of this, but um, uh, Nancy visited when we were over there for the summit uh, of the yes, year, year I went down last. with her on that oh, very well, moving yeah. uh, I know moment. it's going to be, and uh -huh. I've had letters from uh, I had a letter from a young girl whose father didn't die there, came home, but she told me so eloquently in the letter how it was the most significant moment in her father's life. Mm -hmm. And so all the time from a child up, she remembers the stories that he would tell, including his own feelings about that oh, day. Yeah. And he died a few years ago of cancer. And she and her family just feel that they must go there now and see that place that meant so much to him. Is there any particular one of the beaches or spots that you are interested in that, uh, that you want to see especially? No, there are so many great and heroic stories about all of them that I don't suppose you can see them all, but uh, you know, Omaha Beach, of course, was the, uh, the one that seemed to uh, linger most in everyone's mind, but then the other spots, the one where the rangers climbed those sheer bluffs yeah. under fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that uh, was something. What, uh, did you have any feelings at that time about Franklin Roosevelt as the man that uh, ordered this? And uh, you know, when you were in, when you heard of, of D-Day and uh, well, the whole operation, the president's yeah. role in it. Well, you at that time, I was a New Deal Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, I thought that uh, he was a great war leader when we were, once we were in there. And uh, so I, I had no criticism of any kind. I see. What's your sense now, uh, sitting here in the office, uh, looking back, I think you said the other day at Arlington or someplace uh, that, we, that this sort of thing won't happen again, hopefully. Uh, but as a president that would have to order that kind of an immense, uh, assault uh, by armed forces. Do you have any other thoughts uh, from well, this perspective? Well, yes, uh, and yet the how inevitable it seemed to become that we had no choice 
but to become involved. And then, of course, the Japanese uh, took care of that with the Pearl Harbor attack. But at the same time, I remember this about him, in all fairness. When Hitler first was rattling the saber and uh, doing the things, and there was the great controversy of uh, should we take him seriously or not, 1938, I believe it was, that Roosevelt made a speech in Chicago. And in that speech, he called for what we would call the free world to quarantine Nazi Germany, to close its borders to any kind of contact, even to a phone call, to simply seal them off until they would agree to join the, the other nations in disarming and stopping and settling the disputes uh, without conflict. And he was so assailed for that speech, so criticized for it, that you, now you look back and see, isn't this some of the same thing that we talk about uh, today and that we've, not as much so with regard to any possible threat, but you say, had we done that, there wouldn't have been a World War II. Some ways, so many yeah. places along that yeah. route have had we, others taken yeah. action. And by the same terms, their tone, he, he was begging his own Congress, and it was his, so it wasn't partisan, he was begging for more of a buildup. And when you stop to think, that was only days before the uh, uh, Pearl Harbor that Congress retained the draft, and I think it was by only one vote that they were trying to even cancel the, the draft. I know that some of our military men, when they could talk to their counterparts in Japan, uh, asked them, why Pearl Harbor? And the Japanese said, why not? They said, we didn't think you'd fight. You were having your great Louisiana maneuvers, they were the biggest war games I think we've ever had. Yeah. And he said, some of your soldiers were carrying wooden guns and you used cardboard tanks to simulate armored, war yeah. uh, armored warfare. What's your uh, feeling, any, uh, any sense of this now, as, again, as president, the, the difficulty uh, in this office of ordering men, and particularly like D-Day, so many, in such a tough fight so far away? Oh, this must be the most heartbreaking thing that anyone could ever have to do. Uh, we know the story about Ike visiting the paratroopers the night before and that he was crying when, after the, when they climbed aboard the planes and flew out. But I've often wondered sometimes if um, the deaths that we've had among so many in high command positions in the military and uh, so many of them uh, uh, seem to be heart uh, problems. And you wonder if that couldn't be from the stress and then afterward to live with the thought of uh, maybe second guessing and wondering uh, had you done all you could do to, uh, to minimize casualties. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I've wondered that sometimes. And these, how does this compare, do you think, D-Day in uh, terms of our nation's history, uh, rank with our military efforts and uh, just the, th the big events in our national life? Oh, I think it is a, a, there's no question about the magnitude of, of that, that war and that operation. I don't know of any other war that quite reached the dimensions, no war reached the dimensions of that one. That truly was a world war, and we were fighting on, uh, across both oceans. And that operation, uh, uh, it was necessary. It had to be done. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the movie The Longest Day? Yes. The Cornelius uh, mm -hmm. Ryan movie of some time ago? Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. Which was fairly graphic, I think. Oh yes. Shot of it. Any uh, lastly, uh, any going to do anything special uh, other than the ceremony uh, over there? Uh, no. Uh, mm -mm. 
just going to look. It's at yeah. several places. Mm -hmm. they, at least yeah. we are getting mm -hmm. to the various mm -hmm. spots. No, I'm looking forward to it, although I, I know I'll probably have trouble getting through it. Yeah, I see. Again, one of those very emotional uh, yeah. times. I found myself uh, getting unable to speak at the recent ceremony for the mm -hmm. unknown soldier. Mm -hmm. You, you know. You see the veterans today, and I think of our young people. I once said to Bob Hope that he has all that film from all those trips that he made. And I said, Bob, did you ever think about putting all of that together just so that kids today could see kids of yesteryear? They, you know, no one ever thinks their parents are young. <laughs> and so uh, you see today the, the veterans and so yeah. forth, and it's impossible for young people particularly to visualize them as young people. And I'll always remember what George Marshall said about them. Someone asked him if we had any secret weapon, and he said, yes, the best damn kids in the world. Great. On that note, Mr. President, thank you. All right. Yeah. I'll see you there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah.